Okay, so my name is Jeff Craig. I am a front engineer with, uh, with Mebo. Uh, Mebo recently started using uh, YUI3 on, um, on our uh, Mebo.com properties, and, uh, and we're, we're, we've been really excited about the library and, uh, and, and using it. And personally, I've been using it since 2007, uh, shortly, and I, I, start, I moved over to, uh, to the 3.x series very shortly after it was announced. Um, so today, I'm going to be talking a bit about Loader. Um, I'm calling it Demystifying Loader, and I'm going to go into a lot of the functionality that exists on Loader that's not terribly well documented. But what I'm going to be straying away from is how Loader is actually implemented internally um, for two reasons. One, as Dave said, he's lost a lot of hair over the way Loader is implemented internally. And two, um, it, there's a lot of that that's, that's going to be changing, but this configuration stuff should, should remain the same moving forward. Um, but before, I, I think we really need to talk about kind of where this, this module loading stuff has come from. Um, for the last 10 years or so, there's been a lot of discussion around dynamic script loading and how do we get JavaScript on the page in a way that doesn't um, impact page performance. Um, and, and during that time, we've also been modularizing our code. You know, we've all come from these, we all come from these backgrounds where you're, you're breaking your functionality out into classes and, and you're doing all this modularization. Um, but the way that, that we've been shipping as we've been doing this dynamic script loading was really centered around pushing all of that code out to the browser at once, regardless of which pieces you were going to be using. And that's where YUI really shines, is in minimizing the amount of, amount of code that's going over the wire. Um, so just as a brief timeline, uh, YUI 3 loader work really began in, in uh, the latter part of 07 by Adam Moore, who maintained the project at that time. And this probably isn't the first time of this sort of module loader being used in JavaScript, but I couldn't find an example elsewhere, so maybe it is. I'm not sure. Uh, later that year, uh, early the next year, we saw a using JS library that didn't seem to get a lot of traction. Uh, in uh, beginning of 2009, Common JS begins, and they start trying to really standardize the way that we use JavaScript. Um, April of that year, Node.js gets its module implementation, which eventually takes over, which eventually becomes what CommonJS's module implementation looks like. Uh, September of that of, of 09, uh, Require.js begins and starts defining what's known as the uh, the um, asynchronous module definition or AMD, uh, which is actually likely to be supported in a in a coming version of of YUI. There's a couple of community members that are really interested in, in allowing AMD modules to work cleanly with Loader, and then of course just last month. Um, Require JS went 1.0, and these this issue of, of modules is so important that it's actually going to be making it into the core of the language um, in in Harmony, which which uh, is going to be the next big version of, of JavaScript to be released. Um, so moving forward, we'll actually start getting into the conf in getting into the configuration pieces, and I just want to give a, a, a brief talk about um, I just want to give a brief talk about. Uh, the beginning of how you actually get your code onto the page using Loader. And this really boils down to, um, to just a handful of, uh, of properties. And this, this, this slide is going to serve as kind of a roadmap where, where we'll go from top to bottom, I'll highlight the sections, and then break them down into, uh, into the, the tighter versions of what we're actually going to be talking about. Um, but first, let's talk about static loading. Um, static loading is is just loading you know, your files one after another onto your page. You just accomplish this by setting your, your combined value to false, giving a base URL where all of your JavaScript can be found, and then your module definitions give this, gives, the, uh, gives the specific places where, where these things can be found. Uh, this leads to a waterfall diagram that resembles this. Um, I've got nearly 30 requests. All I'm doing here is loading widget um, from, from a raw page. It takes nearly half a second and loads about 50 kilobytes of, of data across the wire. For debugging, this is fantastic. Um, you know, working, working with your files in, in discrete units where it will map very directly to what's actually on your file system is great. But it can be done better in a production environment, which is why YUI has been really pushing this idea of combo loading. Um, again, we just set the combined value to true. Uh, we supply a different base path for our, for our combo loader, and then um, break out that, that root that's appended to all of our module definitions um, into a separate property. This is great because your module definitions don't need to change, and you get a very different loader story. What we end up with is this. Two requests, one, uh, you know, the combo request for uh, CSS and, uh, and the, the JavaScript, under 100 millisecond response time, we actually, say, we actually uh, shave nearly 20 kilobytes off of the request path because a larger file can be compressed a lot better via gzip. Um, in the non in the non uh, in the non compressed or the non combined version, um, a lot of the files inside of YUI are under 
are under a full kilobyte. I mean, they're very small files, which gives a lot of flexibility that um, in the way that you use the library, but, but it's not a great loader story. So the short version is use combo loading in production. Um, there's plenty of combo loaders available, and uh, the, these I came up with in about a 10 minute search on GitHub, um, and they come primarily from the YUI community. The .NET one was developed by Gabe Muthart. I've actually had a, got a, a few patches in that as well. The Node.js one, Ryan Grove did. Um, the PHP version is maintained by Yahoo, inter by, by Yahoo internally. The Python version by Chris George, a former Yahoo who now works at, Serv Sur uh, at SurveyMonkey. And I don't remember who the Ruby one did. I didn't recognize that person, but it's, it's drop and replaceable for if you're in a Ruby environment. Um, so there's a lot of flexibility there, and that's really all I'm going to say about combo loading. Um, you don't necessarily need to use it in, in development. There's some advantages to not using it in development, but if you're not using it in production, you're using loader wrong. So let's move on and talk about how modules are actually defined. Um, oh. so, we'll, we'll, so these are the, um, the properties that are really necessary in order to make modules work um, inside, of, inside of the library. Uh, and we'll talk about the first five first. Um, type, path, full path requires an optional. Um, so this is a very basic, um, a very basic module configuration that you'll see um, for really anything in the library. Um, you give it a name, which is just going to be the key on your hash. Um, this is a sent in via just a hash table. Um, the, the type is JavaScript or CSS. Uh, path is a path to where it's found. In this case, I'm actually following the way YUI Builder generates, your, um, generates the, the paths where it's module name slash module name dash min. Um, and then a list of the requirements that, that my module, uh, in this case Mebo module, I'm, good, I'm requiring base and base dash build, so that if, if those things aren't available, my module can't run. Um, and then you've got a list of optional requirements if you're taking advantage of, of, of the ability to load those optional requirements. Uh, that can be useful as well. Um, the thing is, the loader uh, really is built around sensible defaults, so you only need, um, I'm going to hope that's not me and set that over there. Okay, so you really only need the requirements. Um, if you're using the same, path, the same pathing styles that YUI already uses, if you're loading JavaScript files, you only really need to give us the requirements. Everything else will be inferred automatically for you by loader, and, uh, and you'll just save yourself some k-weight build, when building out your, your module definitions. The, uh, the other piece is um, the full path, and full path is really useful if you're loading um, a module that doesn't share common configuration, like it, it's not on the same server as any of your other code, it's, it, you know, you're loading it from some, from some external site that you don't necessarily have a lot of control of, you can just give it a, a straight URL and pull in code from anywhere. Um, there's pros and cons to doing that. Um, you know, generally you're going to want control over where your modules are coming from, but you have the option to load code from, from anywhere. Um, the next thing that, that um, Loader implemented, and this is, uh, this is somewhat new in, in 3.4, maybe it was 3.4.1. Um, there, there's always been the idea of rollups in Loader where you can get combined sets of functionality and call them by an alias, a shorter name. Um, with 3.4.1, um, they've gotten rid of the old, the old ways of doing it because there were some inefficiencies. Um, they were really great in the non, like the, the old mechanisms would, um, would create JavaScript files on the file system that contained multiple modules, and they were really nice if you, were, um, if you weren't using a combo loader. But since the benefits to using a combo loader are so great, you should be anyway. And so we've moved to just the simplified use version, where now I've declared a Mebo stack module that is just the modules that I want on, on any page that's using Mebo. And, um, and I just give it a list of modules that, that comprise my base stack, and it will, it will automatically extend and load those modules for me without needing to, um, without needing to worry about um, things. And, 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 but the, you know, excuse me. It also gives me the benefit of if I, don't, if I only want a part of this stack, I'm never forced to bring in more code than I want, which was a problem in the old, in the old uh, roll-up system. Um, so just a lot of, a lot of nice flexibility, uh, a lot of nice flexibility there. Um, after is, uh, you're not, you don't see after used uh, in anywhere except the CSS modules. After ensures that if you're loading uh, a module with other modules in its dependency chain, that they're added to the DOM in the correct order. Um, so the re that's the reason you only see it with the CSS modules. Um, you know, your, modules, your CSS modules need to be defined in a consistent order for, for the cascade to work correctly. And so you'll use after to, to make sure that the order in which things are pulled in is, is sensible and, and reasonable. 
Um, internationalization is one of the really key features to um, is one of the really key features to Loader. I'll be talking about this in a little bit more detail um, later when we talk about the the global configuration for um, Loader, but. The, here you basically just provide a list of the um, a list of the languages that you have language packs for on the server. Um, they're they're the standard ISO codes, you know, EN for English, EN US for US English, or or GB for for um, for British English, and uh, just the, the, the normal ISO codes that you're going to see everywhere, and that are sent by the browser to your um, to your server if you're doing content negotiation of that type. Um, Again, we'll go into more detail on how that actually works um, a little bit later in the talk. And then the other really big piece to Loader, and this is like this is one thing that I really want to drive home. If you're not using conditional loading, you're you're not getting the best that you can out of YUI's Loader. Um, but conditional loading is a way to minimize the amount of code that you're loading, especially around the idea of polyfills. Uh, everybody, I, I I hope has heard the term polyfill, but just as a as a um, brief definition, a polyfill is where you're adding is where you're using JavaScript code to add missing native functionality. Um, so uh, here's just an example of of, uh, of a simple local storage module, um, and this is the, there are there are storage there's a storage module in core now. It's not implemented in this way. This is uh, this is just an example, um, but I've declared a local storage module that I've really provided no pr pr provided no details for because I, I don't actually care about that module all that much. Um, what I care more about are is like here I've got local storage native which implements the. Um, which just implements a simple wrapper around local storage that can be used. Um, but I want it to be loaded uh, in this case when I see the local storage has been requested, I'm going to run my test function inside of my condition. And if my test function returns true, I want to load, um, I want to load local storage native instead of, of local storage. The other valid values for, um, for when are before or after. So depending on how you're structuring your, your, your polyfill replacement, um, after is the default because it seems that most of the implementations that are in core right now that, that utilize this um, will load in a base set of functionality that, that's shared between all of the, the polyfilled versions and then um, just augment that with the, uh, with the versions that actually fill in the, the browser specific um, implementations. Um, and then you know, here's as another example. I've, I'm loading one that uses Google Gears, and so my test function. The rest of it's exactly the same. But my test function instead is just testing for the existence of the Google Gears object. Um, Google Gears, yes, is, is far less relevant than it was uh, today than it was a, a few years ago. But if you're, you're you need to support very old browsers, it can still be a useful thing to test for. Uh, and then finally. Um, Here's a test for global storage. Uh, global storage was the uh, early version of local storage that was in Firefox 2. Um, and the, the only real difference here, aside from the, the, the test testing for, for global storage, is you have the ability to limit your test by user agent. And that's just going to test the, uh, the y.env.ua object for a value, uh, or non-zero value. Um, you, you see that uh, implemented throughout um, or well, not necessarily throughout. You do see that implemented in um, the conditional loading for graphics, because um, graphics needs to be able to load different uh, different different versions to use either Canvas, uh, SVG, or VML. And so for the VML version, which is only relevant for Internet Explorer, it will test a user agent um, against IE just to make sure that. Um, just to do a quick test to see if it's worth even uh, even running the conditional test, because some sometimes your conditional test can get a little bit heavier, especially if they they do their feature detection by um, by manipulating the DOM at all. Um, so that's just the, the really basic version of, of conditional loading. It's one of the most important features of YUI Loader, and none of the other JavaScript loading um, frameworks that I've seen that people are working on even try to address this question of how do I minimize the amount of code that I send down the wire by using by, by testing for functionality before I even pull in the, the requests that, uh, that the users, um, or by even pulling in the functionality that the user wants. Um, so this is this is probably one of the most important takeaways from this talk that I that I think you might be able to get. And um, so that's that's the basics of, of configuring your modules. I'm next going to move on to uh, to module groups. And a group is just a collection of modules that com that that combines um, existing function or that combines existing um, maybe different uh, different modules. Like so, 
up above, um, you know, my combo URL and my base URL resemble the, the combo URL for the Yahoo CDN. But for, for Mebo, we're defining our own modules, and so we want to load our we want to load our modules off of the um, off of the Mebo CDN as opposed to the to the Yahoo one. So I'm defining a different combo URL and a different base URL, um, and then defining all of my modules under under that location. Um, I seem to have lost the link between the two windows. Okay, we'll just go and do that. I've lost my notes. So. So uh, as, as, as I pointed out, the, the big thing about the, the first thing about groups that's convenient is that overriding of the, of the, uh, the config from the parent um, from, the, from the root of your, um, of your configuration for loader. Um, but it, but it, goes much deep, it goes much deeper than that. Um, the, the module definitions that you're going to provide are going to look ex identical to the ones that you're going to uh, provide in, in um, are going to look identical to the ones that you're going to provide earlier. But the big feature that's in groups that isn't elsewhere is this idea of patterns. Um, patterns is, a, is um, the way that YUI Gallery works, as well as the YUI 2 and 3 project. Because there's, um, as Dave said this morning, there's 350 modules in Gallery. You don't want the YUI team to force the module definitions for 350 modules in Gallery on you when you're not going to use any of them. And so they use patterns in order to load them, in order to create those definitions dynamically, um, similar to what I'm, what I'm showing here. And there, there's a couple of different ways to use patterns. Uh, first, if you have just a really simple override that you need to do on the base class, you provide an object. Here, I, I'm declaring a amiibo CSS prefix. Um, these, these strings are matched using index of um, when it can't find the module definition predefined. Um, so this acts as, acts as a fallback. And all it's going to do is replace the type with, with CSS and then use the defaults um, provided by the YUI loader against um, the base URL provided by my group. Um, here's, a, here's a function, or here's a method that um, is kind of an interesting example. Uh, the the patterns don't enforce a prefix on your um, on the on what you're defining. Um, so here I'm using a postfix uh, dash debug, and what this function will what this configuration function will do is that after the loader has built all my defaults for the um, after the loader has built all the defaults, it's, it'll call my configuration function and allow that to do anything that it, anything that it wants to or needs to with the uh, with the, the block of configuration that that loader has built out for me. And so in this case, all I'm doing is I'm getting rid of the dash debug inside of the, um, inside of the module name. So if I were to request a module node dash debug, mod name is going to become node. And then I'm going to build a path that points to node and load the debug version instead of the minified version. Um, so th this is an interesting thing you can do with patterns. There's actually better ways of loading debug versions, which we'll get to um, in a few minutes. But you have full control um, via this configuration function of what actually is loaded off of the is loaded off of the server. And then your configuration functions. You know, maybe you don't organize your code the way that the base library does, where you've got um, everything under a um, module name slash module name, uh, you know, module name folder with the module name dash min as your JavaScript name. So in this case, I'm just replacing. My, my path with, um, with script slash module name dash min. And that way, all of my, my code can run in the same place. So it gives me some flexibility in the way that I organize my code. Um, patterns, are, again, as I said, are amazing in development. I don't need to mess around with my, um, using patterns, I don't need to mess around with my metadata every single time that I'm, I'm, I'm developing something in real time. Any, if I want to add a new module, I just simply add it, make sure it's in the, in the right location, and I can start working, up, working with it immediately without needing to generate new metadata. Saves a lot of time. But this is a really unfortunate code path through Loader. Um, this is slow, like really, really slow. You don't want to do this in production. Um, so one of the tools that I really want to see and that, um, and that, that, that I am actually may be, may be writing very soon is something for the YUI gallery that allows you to extract metadata for gallery modules in order to put them into your application quickly uh, so, that they can be, so that they can be loaded just as fast as a uh, as a base, um, as anything in, in core. The other weakness here is that I can't infer requirements off of this, so my requires are all blank. Uh, they, they can, I, I'm not defining the requirements at all. So what loader will end up doing is it will load, like it will load one of these modules, see if there's any requirements that are unmet, and then need to make additional um, requests. The other reason, so that's, that's the other reason you don't want to use this in production. It ends up falling back to a model very similar to that non-combo loader um, environment that, again, you, is just really best to be avoided. Um, 
But again, amazing for development, allows you to, to rapid prototype things much better, but not ideal in the, in the production environment. Um, so let's go ahead and move on and, and, and let's talk about the other pieces of the configuration object that, that, that aren't related to, to modules. And so we already talked about base, combo base, and root. I'm not going to go back into those. Um, but let's start that conversation about internationalization that I promised earlier. So in your module config, as I said, you define your module, give it its requirements, and then a list of the languages that, that it provides. Here's a, a fictional Amiibo login module that supports English, uh, British English. We, we have uh, an, an English engineer, and, and he doesn't want US type English in his, uh, in his login module. Uh, Spanish, Japanese, and French. And in the loader config, um, you know, for most of your browsers are going to send um, the, the specific sub, uh, sub classification of the language. So this is actually what would come out of my browser, English US, followed by followed by just plain English. And what lo sorry, and what loader is actually going to do is it's going to step through this language array that I'm providing here, uh, item by item, and test it against the languages defined for the module. And when it finds a match, um, it's going to then request that language for the module and, and pull in those strings so that I can uh, internationalize, inter uh, create the, just the language pack for my module um, and, and load, it, load it cleanly. Um, Incidentally, loader will actually test uh, e like en-us and then en based on that first um, on that first, uh, most browsers are going to send in both keys. Um, it's a little bit redundant, but that's the way the browsers have kind of always done it. And so this is a way to just get user-specific information. It's like, so this, you're getting your, your configuration for your user, user in there, getting your internationalization. Not quite for free, um, and I'm not going to go into the details of how you structure your module for internationalization, but from a loader perspective, there's very little that you need to do. And it's really a clean mechanism for, um, for handling getting those strings into your, um, into your, into your application. Um, the next two pieces are um, you've got the ability to, to configure loader to do um, just some different, different things. You can ignore a module in, um, in your environment, um, which basically says if you see a request for a module with this name, um, in this case I'm using console, don't pull it in under any circumstances. So my use statement will pull in, will try to, will try to request node and console, and in this case I'll only get node um, because I've told loader never to pull in console. Uh, you need to be a little bit careful with using ignore. Um, whatever's inside of your callback that you're actually using, if it expects console to be there and it's not, it's going to break. So there's some there's some things that you need to be careful with about using it. But it is a way that if you've got these submodules or these these other modules that are useful in development but not in, in production, or you want to just change behavior of things, there's a way to do it without necessarily modifying all of your instances directly. Uh, finally, you've got a way to always force a module to load from the CDN no matter what. Um, in this case, I'm adding in just an, an add module um, that, that I'm, I'm saying is forced, giving it a full path to double click, um, and then defining a later. So I'm, I'm using a, um, a set interval so that every 60 seconds, I'm going to request the add module from the CDN that's going to go out, pull that, pull that off, of, off of double click every, every, every minute, and then do whatever's inside of that, do whatever's inside of that function. Um, I'm, uh, you know, th this is this is definitely a contrived example. Um, you wouldn't actually do ad, ad, ad loading this way. I, I do ad loading on a daily basis, um, but it just you know it's an option that you have, um, and there may there may be uh, there's probably more useful cases out there. And if anybody knows of any, um, I'd love to hear them because I I want to update the y, the loader documentation with some of the things that I've learned preparing for this talk, and and I, I really want useful examples um, to put up in the documentation. And this this unfortunately isn't one, um, but you know, Force I'm sure has has use cases out there that uh, that other people um, can be aware of. So then um, we move into filtering. And when I talked about like, how my pattern for, for debug was not an ideal way of, of loading debug versions of modules, filters are really what I was talking about. Um, so there are the filters are provided. Um, there's two filters that are pre-provided by the YUI base. And those are raw and debug. Raw loads the non-minified version of the file that does not include log statements. And debug includes the non-minified version that does include log statements. Um, and groups can be applied, or, or filters can be applied at the group level. Um, so in this case, you know, I'm, I'm going to get the raw YUI stuff, but I, I won't get all their log messages on my console. But I will still get the, uh, but I will still get the, uh, oops, shit, sorry. But I will still get the uh, the debug versions of of anything under of any models declared under the Mebo group. Um, and then there there's the slightly more useful case even of being able to load. 
um, filters on a module by module basis. So in this case, I've, I've got a module somewhere named node that's going to be in core. And I want the raw version of that. And then I've declared a special Mebo version of node that I want the debug version of. So I only get the log messages out of Mebo node, but I can still easily step into the code for, for the base node class, which my Mebo node is, is most likely um, based upon. Um, Filters are not uh, modules are, are not um, group specific, but um, you know it's all based on module names. Uh, so you know as long as you're naming your modules in a consistent way, um, you shouldn't have any any problems with that. And so the last uh, last things I want to talk about um, regarding related to the base configuration are just these little bit of DOM details. Um, insert before. Um, is used to define a ID where you want your modules to go in, um, where you want your, your, your scripts and, and, and CSS to be loaded um, before. That's primarily useful um, in older browsers. Um, I know at least Firefox 2, and I haven't tested this in newer versions recently. Um, if, you just, if you didn't define your print style sheet in older versions of Firefox after all of your other style sheets, they would just simply fail to work. Um, and so, you, so you know, I would always have to define my print style sheet as having, a, um, having an ID that I could then send it to insert before so that I knew that my, any, any, any uh, CSS loaded by, um, any CSS loaded by, uh, by, the, by the YUI loader would definitely be ahead in the DOM um, tree from where, uh, from where my, um, from where my, uh, my print style sheet was. Uh, JS attributes and CSS attributes are key value pairs where you can set the attributes that you want set on those. Um, they are set globally. There is no way to do those currently on the module by module level. Um, that's something that I would actually like to see in, uh, come in, in future versions of Loader. Um, but I don't know how, how likely that is at the moment. Uh, I haven't opened the bug for it yet. So um, we'll, I'll be doing that soon. And then timeout, you can have an error method called um, if for some reason Loader is unable to return um, in, a reasonable, in a reasonable time frame. Um, I'm not sure what the name of the, the property is at the moment, because uh, I only found out about it yesterday. But um, you can also set here um, how long you want your, your combo loader strings to be, um, so that you can currently they're set in 3.4.1 to, uh, to 20, 2048 characters. Um, in 3.5, from what I understand, they're going to be set to 1024, so you'll be able to take advantage of parallel loading a little bit better. But it also ensures that, um, that proxies are less likely to um, interfere with, with trying to load um, really long. Sorry about that. Our proxies are less likely to interfere with trying to load um, really long URLs. Um, what's that? Max URL length? OK, so there, there's, there's Dave. Max URL length, um, camel case, no doubt. And, uh, and that will let you, let you set that. So you, if you're having problems with proxies today, you can always uh, go in and modify that um, at this level. So how do you actually get this configuration data into, into Loader? And, and currently, there's four, four methods to, on which to do that. Um, the first is yui.globalconfig, which um, is, was added originally for Node.js. Um, so if you're, if you're going to be running in, in the Node.js environment, you shouldn't touch that at all. Um, but what, it, what I think it's really useful for is um, if you're creating your own custom seed file, uh, why, like yui.globalconfig seems like a really good place to me to put your module definitions for all of your applications. Anything that's going to be true um, across all page loads, stuff that you want to, um, that you, that you want to be static and to, to have the benefits of a CDN. Um, before, the way that was always suggested that you do that was a yui underscore config, and that, that object's still useful. To me, this is more useful for page level configuration. So like that language, like the internationalization support, um, I, would, I would build that into my, my templates to do the content negotiation to build out, um, to build out that array of, of languages in the order that the user wants them, and apply that in, in yui underscore config. Um, and then any arguments that you give to the YUI method. Um, so when you're building out your instance, you can have those mixed in. Uh, these are applied directly with with, uh, with y.mix. So anything in the, anything that you send as an argument to the YUI method is going to end up um, overriding anything in YUI underscore config, which ends up overriding anything in uh, yui.globalconfig. So it allows you, to, so if you, if you do have things that you really do need to change, you do have the ability to do that at all three of those levels. Um, 
but you can you can uh, separate out your configuration into multiple locations in order to best take advantage of where that should be. Your module definitions aren't likely to change. You might as well put those into a into a more global object than your instance level um, or your even page level uh, arguments that you might have. And then finally, um, the Y method or the Y object has an apply config method. So if you need to add modules at runtime after after loader has already begun, if you need to to change configurations, let's say a user wants to change their language and you want to be able to support that via a cookie or something, uh, apply config can, can help you in that, in that case. Um, the, this, the bottom two of these, in my opinion, are a little bit less useful than the top two. I think the vast majority of your configuration will be constrained to those first two, uh, first two locations. But it's nice to have that flexibility to, to modify it even more if, uh, if you require it. And so that's, that's really all I have um, right now. Uh, just various places I can be found online. I'm often in the, uh, the, the IRC channel, at least idling. Um, I'm a little bit less active than I used to be, but I'm going to try to try to correct that. Again, my name is Jeff Craig. I go by Foxtrot throughout the community. So if you see a Foxtrot online, there's a reasonable chance it's me. Um, and again, thank you all for coming. And I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference.